At the outset, uh, let me thank uh, IMA Kodabakum for inviting me again, and in particular thanks to Dr. Mani. I was originally invited to speak on distress, anxiety, and depression. If I had to deal with all three topics in 18 minutes, I'll be anxious, you'll be distressed and depressed. <laughs> so I really thought I should restrict my presentation only to the very common anxiety disorder that all of us in practice will see. Today, anxiety disorders do not belong to the domain of psychiatrists. Essentially, it is the general practitioners who deal with anxiety disorders. Or, it is even non-medical people to whom the worried people flock to. So obviously, I'm going to dwell on a topic which is certainly not necessarily in the domain of psychiatry, only because it's an extremely prevalent condition and often it is misdiagnosed and not treated appropriately. I think human beings are very notorious to become anxious because it is a very universal phenomenon. I wonder if there is anybody in this audience, August audience, who have never experienced anxiety. Anxiety is an adaptive behavior of every organism. If the adaptive behavior fails, that's when the anxiety disorder manifests. So you can actually trace anxiety to the evolution of human beings and the human nature itself. Primarily when physicians talked about anxiety disorders in the past, the focus was primarily on somatic manifestations. The physical manifestations of anxiety was only given predominance. It's only very late when the psychoanalysts begin to look at the subjective elements of anxiety, it became very predominant and the common thread of anxiety gave rise to many of the disorders, what we call as anxiety disorders. Now if you really look at the psychiatric classification, there are so many disorders that are classified under anxiety disorders. <coughs> the generalized anxiety disorder and the panic disorder are two disorders commonly encountered in general practice. But there are so many anxiety disorders. Sometimes some of these disorders are very specific, specific fears like social anxiety, fear of speaking in public, a fear of meeting up and mingling in a crowd, or it could be related to completely stress-related issues an acute stress disorder or a post-traumatic stress disorder. Or some of this anxiety could be due to a general medical condition or it could be the resultant of an intoxicant use. Or anxiety disorders could be of a variety of other things like obsessive compulsive disorders. So let me not dwell into all of those issues. I'm only going to highlight on two of the very common disorders, namely generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder. But one would ask, what are the common features in all those disorders? We commonly use the term anxiety and what is the difference between fear and anxiety? If you are chased by a dog or if you are going to be approached by a snake, you are going to be fearful. So when you talk about fear, we are really talking about a reaction to an object which generally human beings are afraid of. If somebody presents a picture of a dog, if you get scared, that becomes anxiety. Anxiety need not even have an object to trigger. It is usually generalized. <coughs> but the characteristic of anxiety disorders or the fear is disproportionate. It is often irrational and usually leads to avoidance of the anxiety triggering situation. Often people would not go to a crowded place because they experience something very painful, very dreadful in a crowded place. And after that they wouldn't want to go to a crowded place. They wouldn't want to enter a lift having experienced suffocation inside a lift. 
So they try to avoid an anxiety triggering situation. So it is an excessive fear, it is irrational and leads to avoidance. That is a classical characteristic of anxiety, which differentiates it from a normal fear which all of us go through. I think it will be useful in clinical practice to look at what are the common causes of anxiety. One would certainly rule out many, many general medical conditions before we start to conclude that this person has an anxiety disorder. <coughs> Common things are hypoglycemia, hyperventilation, Professor Chandrasekhar was referring to carbon dioxide toxicity, which very closely resembles the panic disorder, or hyperthyroidism, classically we have been told from medical students today, how hyperthyroidism presents with anxiety symptoms. Or in these days, where many people are using so many psychoactive substances, many of the psychoactive substances itself can induce anxiety. People who drink 20 cups of coffee every day, or people who use psychoactive drugs like ganja, or mind-altering drugs like hallucinogens, magic mushrooms, or LSD, or even medications like theophylin or sympathomimetic drugs, they all can induce anxiety. Every physician comes across people who present to the clinic with anxiety symptoms often when the person is in a state of withdrawal from alcohol. Alcohol withdrawal notoriously produces anxiety symptoms. And again, benzodiazepine and sedative withdrawal can again produce significant pathological anxiety symptoms. And of course, all the tobacco users, when they abstain from tobacco, abstain from nicotine, and they experience anxiety symptoms. So withdrawal from, from substances is also equally important. And there are many more medical conditions, I think I would probably not talk to this obvious audience, where classically many of these medical conditions can pay way for anxiety symptoms. But to, to have a quick idea in a clinical practice, there are two kinds of anxiety that one will be encountered with. One is what we call as a persistent anxiety, which means the anxiety is pervasive, is present throughout. This persistent anxiety is extremely common with generalized anxiety disorder, alcohol withdrawal or in benzodiazepine withdrawal. Or there are cases of episodic anxiety where the person experiences anxiety periodically and then it comes down and then experiences episodes of this anxiety. Often occurs in panic disorders or in conditions like hypoglycemia, hyperventilation or substance abuse panic episodes. So obviously one should recognize that. The level of anxiety is also very important for us to understand clearly and then deal with it effectively. If somebody has mild anxiety, you don't have to worry about it. Because a mild anxiety actually helps in performance. A lot of people before going to a sports or even before going to an examination or going for a performance, they become very anxious. Little anxious. That mild anxiety for a speaker is very important. Mild anxiety for a student is very important. Mild anxiety for a surgeon is very important for him or her to perform it better. So that certainly increases the level of performance. But when it goes to moderate anxiety, that's when there is trouble to follow in certain directions. There is an impairment to the attentional process, what we call it, an attentional bias. When it is a severe anxiety, physical symptoms start to creep in. So if an individual comes back and presents to you with physical symptoms, you do know that he is not suffering from mild or moderate anxiety, he is having severe anxiety. And of course, when somebody is suffering from panic anxiety, the first thing they want to do is to escape the situation. He wants to run away, he wants to knock on the doctor's clinic and then say, admit me, take an ECG. When he says something like this, he just wants to escape the situation and wants help. And the help-seeking behavior is very characteristic of a panic anxiety. You see people when they have a, you know, like chest pain. Many of these people who had a myocardial infarction, they are very comfortable. They wouldn't be even interested in getting Dr. Nandakumar's number if they are, you know, like the first. But if I am a panic person, I will not only have Dr. Nandakumar's landline, mobile line, day phone, night phone, midnight phone, and I want to have everything all written in my packet, and I would be going, when I walk in a event, when I get into a bus and I am going around, I am only looking for 24 hours clinic. The guy will say, I am traveling every day from Tinagar to Vashwam Infet, but I know how many 24 hour clinics are there. Because anything happens to me, immediately I get out and go for 18 seconds. So obviously he's not having a heart problem, he's having a panic anxiety. 
that's very typical of a panic anxiety person. So I think we need to really understand behind the fear and anxiety is the brain. And the brain is responsible for invoking it. And I think it's very important for us to understand the areas of the brain that are involved are those areas which are responsible for stress, response and memory. I think we cannot forget how the increased function of the CRS or the norepinephrine that mediates the stress response and the dysregulation of HP axis cannot be forgotten if you are dealing with neurophysiology of anxiety. Typically, in the brain area, there is a fear network. That fear network is extremely important for the fear condition. And I think there are many, many, many receptors that are actually responsible for maintaining this anxiety. These receptors come into play when they start medicating them with anti-anxiety agents. Let me talk about this. The neuroimaging is helping us to understand anxiety a lot more better. Otherwise, we would be thinking that it belongs to the medical realm, we would be pushing it to philosophers and other people to deal with anxiety. We are beginning to understand there is a brain behind this anxiety. Anterior cingulate, the insular region, and the amygdala form the triangle of what we call as the fear network. And that network is responsible for fear condition. Why certain neutral stimuli become anxious triggering stimuli? How conditioning is responsible for those neutral stimuli to stimulate fear reactions, anxious reactions in individuals? And I think we are really beginning to understand this a lot better thanks to our neuroimaging techniques. There is a big neuropsychology also behind anxiety disorders. To simplify it, I think the most critical element in anxiety disorder is the attentional bias. And the way stimulus driven attention biases are internally interfering with the goal director activity. The fear conditioning is extremely important. And I think the abnormalities of learning, and that's why the hippocampal areas are involved in learning, is also very important in understanding why we are not able to understand which is the safe environment, which is the unsafe environment. That's why individuals are not able to choose. So we have a clear understanding of why people begin to show the way they are. I'm going to only focus on two disorders which may be clinically important. One is the generalized anxiety disorder. I put certain symptoms that are classical for GAD in red and they are all physical in nature. That's one of the reasons why people presenting with generalized anxiety disorder will be comfortable going to a physician, to a general medical doctor and talk about it rather than coming to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. The classical symptom of anxiety though is worry. Worry is a classical symptom. That's why when it comes to other things, I think somebody was talking about, you know, like uh, uh, Professor, when he was talking about his own experience in FCI, I said, I need to have an animal model. Only then I can talk about whether something is useful or not useful. Yes, we learn everything in psychiatry through animal models. But how do you create an animal model for worry? Can the, you can make the mouse to get worried? The way human beings worry, our worries are too many. Professor Chandrasekhar, after talk, I think a lot of us became very anxious and apprehensive about the future, the way the disaster is happening in the environment. The complexities that we are facing, human beings are facing, that causes us to significant worry. Every year, we add on to our worries. A worry is a classical style. That's why many of the anxiogenic, I mean anti-anxiety agents that we prescribe may deal with so many of the other problems, not necessarily so much about the worry. It's a very difficult symptom to deal with and understand. So worry is a classical symptom of generalized anxiety disorder. Physicians will say, he's well but he's worried. Worry is well. That's all his problem. He is well, but he is worried. He is often coming and presenting problems. He keeps reassuring, he keeps reassuring. But I think thankfully to those worried people, general practitioners also can survive. Otherwise, it's very difficult to survive without those worried people knocking on your doors. So, worry is a classical symptom of GAD. And there are many more signs. Sleep is a very important symptom. Sleep disturbance, notoriously, Difficulty in initiating sleep and difficulty in maintaining sleep is a classical symptom of anxiety. People come and tell you, I spend enormous amount of time thinking in bed, doctor. 
I wonder I'm going to one day become a philosopher because I don't sleep in the night. I'm always thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow or day after. I'm planning for five years after life in the bed. And people have difficulty falling asleep and maintaining their sleep. The sleep is interrupted. And somatic symptoms are too many and they land up with very many physicians depending on what the symptoms is to a cardiologist, to a gastroenterologist, to a neurologist, they can walk in anywhere because the symptoms are predominantly somatic. I think the energy level is a very important thing. This is one common symptom between, you know, like depression as well as anxiety. People say, I'm completely fatigued. Everyday work looks like an Himalayan task to me. I'm a housewife, but looks like how I'm going to cook. I'm going to get through this day. It's impossible for me. Fatigue is a classical symptom. And students will come back and say, I'm not able to concentrate. Middle, middle aged people will come back and say, I'm not able to concentrate in my office. I'm, a, I'm an executive. I can't focus on the board meetings. I'm just failing to focus. And these are very classical symptoms. And of course, there are emotions like anxiety, irritability. Tension is a very common word in our Tamil dictionary now. It's become like a Tamil word. Everybody says I'm tense. Fight from a third standard boy to a, you know, like a 80 year old man. So, how do you treat the generalized anxiety disorder? The predominant treatment for generalized anxiety disorder is non-pharmacological. Thanks to those non-pharmacological treatments, I think India is being looked up upon these days. Because India is a country that has produced pioneering non-pharmacological treatment techniques to the human kind. Meditation and yoga are the key things to relaxation. And I think we need to go back to our history and try to learn those techniques because no other country taught us anti-anxiety measures in such a big way, in a very scientific way, like the way Indians have done. So we need to go back to those relaxation techniques. Western are very popular in talking about this cognitive behavior therapy. It's not very popular in this country only because there are not enough people who do that. The people who proclaim to do that know nothing about cognitive behavior therapy. The problem is, some countries who have invested a lot of money on training cognitive behavior therapy are actually not seeing very good results or spending so much of money because you know, like people require enormous amount of rigorous training to do that. Supportive psychotherapy is lot simpler. What every physician does is supportive psychotherapy because you listen empathetically. You are not judgmental. And you are supporting him, you are reassuring him, you are guiding him. You are allowing him to ventilate. Only the time, very little time that you have does not permit you to do that. Otherwise, you are all great psychotherapists. All their physicians are wonderful, supportive psychotherapists. It is the therapeutic relationship that the doctor has with the client which makes the biggest difference to the client and to the elevation of anxiety symptoms. So we cannot undermine the power of supportive psychotherapy. Sometimes we need to have some co-therapists. Somebody in the family could subserve the role of a supportive psychotherapist. It could be an aunt, it could be an uncle, it could be a grandma. We are not utilizing them properly. We are using mother in law to fund, unfortunately. So, what is the treatment? The treatment for generalized anxiety disorder when we have to do it with medication. Typically, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRA, are the first line of treatment for generalized anxiety disorder. Yes, is a good drug which can effectively treat generalized anxiety disorder. There are many more SSRIs like paracetin, sertraline, fluoxetin. Any of these SSRIs will be effectively used in the treatment of anxiety disorders. Sometimes SNRIs, the drug that acts not only on the serotonin but also on the norepinephrine, is also very important like venlafaxine. Well, the vaccine is also a drug as a first line therapy for people suffering from generalized anxiety disorder. But one must know these drugs carry some side effects. You cannot be giving it to a person who has got an elevated blood pressure. When well, the vaccine probably can elevate the blood pressure more. So you need to be a little careful. So the first line of treatment is actually antidepressants. Even though you make a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder, the treatment you will be providing is actually antidepressant, like an SSRI or when the vaccine. Often what is being given in venal practice is benzodiazepine, particularly short half-life benzodiazepine like alprazolam. Unfortunately, alprazolam has a significant dependent potential. You write a prescription for one week and a person takes it for one week, they are wonderful drugs. 
Anything that is wonderful, probably not so good also. They try to take it. They say, doctor has given me the medication, so why can't I take it? And in this country, you do not require a prescription to refill your, you know, like a drug. And then, I write a prescription 1997. Somebody came and called me on, and then 2012 I see, how are you? I'm still taking the drug. I'm still taking the drug. What drug was that? No, you gave me Alpha Zero, you know, like 1997. I still take it. Can I show me the prescription? 1997 old crumbled, you know, like prescription has been laminated. <laughs> and they are going around, you know, like medical shops and they are able to get the medication. So nobody asked for that day in this country. You know, like laminated prescription, very careful patient. I can trust them. You know, that's how people are giving. Unfortunately, the dependence potential of benzodiazepine is very high and it can cause significant memory impairment, irritability. And so, benzodiazepine should be avoided. Any person prescribing it should carefully monitor. Tell the person, educate the person about the dangers of benzodiazepine. Because you do enormous harm to the person by allowing the person to continue to take benzodiazepine. What if I am not anxious but I am acting stupid? I don't think uh, my wife is going to like it very much. When I am going to search for my purse every day and bother her, where is my purse, where is my glass, where did I give, give me a car key? You know, this is not going to be a very good sign. So obviously that's what would happen if you continue to take. And you write one tablet, they will be taking ten tablets. Because you know, like one is not enough, so I increase it, I increase it, I increase it. So they keep on increasing the medication, that would happen. And there are other drugs like Bustinone. Unfortunately, even though the efficacy of this drug as, drug as an anti-anxiety agent has improved, its use in practice is very little for some strange reason. And there are drugs like pregabalin and gabapentin because they work on the same GABA, you know, like possibly they can also come as good anti-anxiety agents. But the first line of therapy would be still antidepressant, typically SSRIs like acetylopram or vendopactin. And then careful use of benzodiazepines is what I would advocate. Second, what about panic disorder? The panic disorder, again, the only difference between analyzed anxiety disorder and panic disorder is panic disorder is an episodic disorder. The individual has a very high level of anxiety for a few hours or days and then it completely subsides and is alright. When he is very panicky, he knocks into the doctor, he wants help, he is seeking help. And he presents with so many symptoms, which is episodic anxiety, coupled with somatic symptoms. That's why they walk into a medical doctor. Often, medical doctors really deal with panic disorder and then they know how to deal with them. What are the classical things of panic disorder? The avoidance. I don't want to go to this lift. I don't want to go to this place. I don't want to be sitting in this. I don't want to be sitting in the home alone. Because last day when I had a chest pain, nobody was there alone. I was alone. So I want my wife to be all the time with me. And I'm just asking her to accompany me wherever I go. So people actually compel other people to stay with them and they do not want to stay, go out anywhere alone. And then again, treatment for panic disorder is again the first line therapy is antidepressants. So more than non-pharmacological treatment, here pharmacological treatment is the first medication. So for somebody having a panic disorder, you tell them you have panic and then you go for yoga and say, doctor I'm dying of a heart attack, you're wanting me to go for yoga? That's not what I want to do. So obviously you require to come down on the medication with anxiety with medication. So you need to give them antidepressants. SSRI, particularly acetylopram is extremely useful. And there are other drugs like Mirtazepin, which is, a, you know, like a, you have antidepressants and then I think Mirtazepin, Zaboxetin, Mertafaxin, sodium valproate including Imipramine, Glomipramine, all very useful in the treatment of panic disorder. Again, Clonazepam is very useful to reduce the panic episode dramatically but unless and until you carefully tell the person this individual cannot take this drug for more than one day and monitor it, it's not wise to prescribe to them. So I think it should be given with a very supervised uh, prescription. So fundamentally, even though you want to really clinically differentiate between the two, because you are a clinician, you want to know whether it's a generalized anxiety or a panic disorder, in terms of treatment, both pharmacologically provide the same kind of treatment. There is no fundamental difference. In both, you possibly have to give benzodiazepine a lot more carefully. Okay, I think it's very important that you provide family and patient education. I believe if families have to be educated about anxiety disorder. Because this is one disorder, if it is unattended, untreated, you can significantly interfere with the quality of life. Anxiety increases suicide risk. Anxiety often occurs with other comorbidities, medical comorbidities, 
and psychiatric comorbidities like depression. It, God is not very kind to some people. You can have many more diseases in a single individual. So I can have anxiety, depression, diabetes, blood pressure and a heart disease. And I think my life can be quite miserable. Obviously, people have to be educated. Whereas physicians can effectively deal with many of the physical disorders with evidence-based medication. When it comes to anxiety, they say, it need not be attended to. All we need to tell them is, you know, like, don't worry. That's not going to help them. They require treatment, specific treatment to address the anxiety. Because if you do not address the anxiety, it's going to impact on the quality of life and it's going to impact on the treatment adherence for other conditions. In your opinion, heart disease is more important, diabetes is more important. In patient's opinion, his worry is more important than anything else. That interferes with him, with his functioning. That interferes with productivity much more than other things. So we need to provide them with medication. And it is not as though a lot of physicians will say, you can have the presence, can I give it for one week, after one week the person come back and say, he's all right, should I stop the medication? Unfortunately, if you stop the medication, the symptoms will re-emerge all over again with vengeance, with greater intensity. So you need to provide treatment for sufficient duration of time. Six months is the minimum duration of medication that you might have to provide to people who are first episodes. Recurrent episodes may require longer duration. So do not hesitate to give medications like antidepressants for long periods of time, rather restricting to short periods, which will be doing a lot of injustice to patients. Because some physicians sometimes are very averse to people taking psychiatric medication. Because it's a notion among the public that all psychiatric medications are dependence inducing. Whereas the medication that they are comfortably taking is the most dependence inducing drug like alprazolam. They never question it because it's written by a specialist. Whereas when you prescribe an antidepressant, they are worried to take it because they think it is a sedative. You have to educate and say, this is a very specialized treatment for anxiety. And this has to be continued for longer periods of time. This is going to improve the quality of life of the person. And you need to choose a drug with least side effects, which is better drug interaction. Better profile, favorable profile. The choice is with the physician. And it uniquely can be determined along with the person and person's needs. I think it's not enough just to provide medication. A lot of them would also benefit with other non-pharmacological treatments. Suggesting to them physical activity, yoga, meditation, relaxation, or even supportive therapies, some other the relaxation technique would be certainly very helpful. I guess the need in this country is to educate families and patients on the irrational use of benzodiazepines. This is one of my significant concerns. As somebody said, Often we use what we call as a multimodal approach. It's not as though that you know, one treatment is going to work, you know, like that. It's, it's good to have two, three treatments combined together for the person that always works better. So finally to conclude, I believe anxiety disorders are extremely common. Because Jitri Krishnamurti, the famous philosopher, once said, you know, anxiety is a movement of thought in time. I remember he said that in Adaya, he used to visit and sit under the Dalian tree and deliver his lectures. And I was a postgraduate student in psychiatry in 1976 when I listened to this lecture. I don't think psychiatric textbooks ever captured the depth of anxiety the way J. Krishnamurti talked about. He said it's a movement of thought in time. He said you're never anxious about the present. The present is always beautiful. But human beings can never focus on the present. He's always thinking of something past which is stored in his brain, somewhere in the brain. And he's thinking about the devil of the mother in law who's at home why he should be actually sitting and watching this very comfortably. Or he's thinking about something unknown that's going to happen day after tomorrow. So he said the moment of thought in time, if only human beings can arrest the flow, going backwards and forwards, and focus on the present, human beings will be so much better off. 
He said anxiety is a pay that we pay for our civilization. He said that in 1976, today the evolutionary model of psychiatric disorders is telling us exactly pretty much what he talked about. So it's a very common disorder, a disorder that presents not just in the mind but also presents in the body with so many somatic symptoms. So fortunately they will still come to a physician and ask for help. And it is the duty of the physician to recognize the worry, appropriately make a diagnosis and respond to it adequately by prescribing antidepressants as the first line of treatment for an adequate period of time and combined with other non-pharmacological methods like relaxation and support and guidance, people can certainly live a very meaningful, productive, worryless life. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sir, for a very interesting talk. The anxiety was so interesting, and so distress and depression must be worked for it. We must talk about it some other time. Are, are there any questions? Sir? What is the difference between the dizziness and the major risk? One of the things human beings have learned when they get worried when they have somatic manifestations which are difficult for them to discern and describe is the language. The more sophisticated you are in the language, you communicate that to the physician. Often, if you try and understand many of the descriptions of anxious people and you can fit into any disorder because they are not able to actually describe what is happening in their head. So they might start landing up and saying their head is light or heavy, they are dizzy or they are gas. It only shows the amount of thoughts that are intruding into their mind excessively producing a disturbance in their mind. So when they translate into a you know, physical symptom, it's extremely difficult because across cultures, across cultures, the way people describe symptoms are entirely different. So we have a concept like in this country, you cannot go and talk about psychological problems to a doctor. You go to a busy general practitioner and say, you know, I'm worried, I'm very much worried about this and that. Doctor will say, are you going to talk all this? I'm more worried there are more people waiting outside and they're going to tell me. Right? And so that's the first reaction. Now, where do I go and talk about my problems? And that's certainly not the general practitioner clinic because it's very busy. Sometimes they begin to open and then they curtail and say, Doctor, you're very busy. Maybe some other day I'll come. That they have never day. Another, any other day also is also equally busy. If not more busy. So, what really happens is, somatic symptoms become a token of entry to them. So when they talk about a physical symptom, the doctor is willing to listen. So obviously, when I have something worrying my head, and I start talking about, I am light-headed, or I am heavy, and I am feeling dizzy, or typically our road is wrong, gara I cannot understand what this gar means. If you don't understand gar, that probably means you don't like gar. See, when, when physical disorders have classical symptoms, because vestibular dysfunction, you know how it presents. Typically when somebody, you know, like areas are involved and pathology is there, symptoms become very clear. When it is poorly localized, vaguely described, you probably are talking about somebody who cannot communicate that in a language you would understand. So when you try to understand the symptoms, you probably start thinking something else I should put in the bracket and say, explore it in a different way.